Hello, everyone. Welcome into today's Zero Waste Teaching event. We're brought to you by the Conservation Law Foundation. I'm Tyler Pyburn. Today's uh, special program really is all about slashing trash and how can we do that so from a local level to a national level and kind of all points in between. Now, now plastic and uh, its toxicity has really always been a problem. And while we've been making kind of very slow steps, um, and eliminating single-use plastic today, kind of in the age of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're facing kind of potential setbacks, if not outright reversals, really, um, of the gains made so far. Now, it's important, more important than ever, to take a, action to solve this public health crisis. Now, today's program, we're going to be taking a look at some practical solutions to our plastic problem, including how you can push for plastic-free systems um, and other zero-waste policies. Now, joining us today, we've got a, just a, a great panel, really. We have uh, Chris. Chris Kirsty Pesci, uh, the director of CLF Zero Waste Program, as well as Michelle Zicolo, the Massachusetts State Representative. So with that in mind, I want to say first and foremost, welcome into all of those that are viewing. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to really joining us on this event. Now, we are going to be having kind of Q&A for later in the show, but we encourage you to ask questions along the way. So when it comes to Q&A, we'll have them teed up and ready to go. All you have to do if you're on the website You'll see the chat box directly next to the video player itself. Just type in your questions right there. We'll be seeing them. We'll be seeing them later on. Same thing on Facebook. You know how to comment the exact same way. All you have to do is just comment, ask your questions in the comment box below the video itself, and we'll be able to bring those up uh, throughout the course of the program. Now, with that in mind, one other thing I wanted to mention that if you do have any issues throughout the course of the show, if you're having any issues watching, hearing, anything at all, you can reach out to our events manager, Katie Ardry, at kardry at clf.org. That's K-A-R-D-R-E-Y at clf.org. Katie will be able to walk you through the process to get you up and running to make sure you don't have any further issues. So without further ado, I kind of want to dive right into it and bring uh, Kirsty up right now. Kirsty, thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. I know you're coming from one meeting to another, so you're kind of running around, which is your typical day to day. I know that for sure. But with that in mind, before we kind of dive into the problem, really, could you give folks at home that don't know you a little bit of your background, really? Sure. Um, my name, as you said, is Kirsty Petchy. I'm the director of the Zero Waste Project, which we started at CLF uh, in January of 2017, almost four years ago. Uh, we work throughout New England on waste issues. We push back against uh, polluting landfills and incinerators and try and support and incentivize and get rolling all those good zero waste programs like composting and better recycling and reduction um, and reuse all those all those programs uh, I've been an attorney for a very long time now here in Massachusetts grew up here in Massachusetts still live in central mass with my family uh, but I really consider myself a citizen of New England and it's been so great to work with so many great advocates and um, and also the legislators on local officials all across New England. So we're really enjoying this work here at CLF. I love it. Great to hear. Great to hear. So w we mentioned it kind of at the top of the show, plastic being an issue. T talk to me about the problem. What is kind of the overarching problem it itself right now? I, mean, I think we kind of know, but g give us a little bit more background, if you will. Sure. So we're finding ourselves in a really, uh, really important moment and watershed moment in waste, uh, which gives us a great opportunity, though it's also a little alarming and, of course, um, upsetting. The, the uh, problem is that our plastic waste is not getting recycled. It's not recyclable. There is no market for recycling in, in um, the United States. We were sending it to China. China won't take it anymore. So what that means is we are finding out that we, this single stream recycling where everyone's putting everything into the bin, a lot of that is ending up into our in our uh, landfills and incinerators. We need better systems to sort our materials, and we need to be honest about what's actually recyclable. We can recycle glass forever, but we need to separate it out from our cardboard and separate out from our plastic so it has value and, it, and we can recycle it. Our bottle bills do that really well. We can recycle aluminum forever. 
In other words, you can recycle those cans over and over and over again. All metal, you can recycle over and over and over again. Um, plastic, you can only recycle it a few times. And only number one and number two plastic actually has a market. Unfortunately, all these products that are ending up on the conveyor belt at our material recycling facilities, uh, those materials, a lot of them are getting thrown away or they're mixed in with other plastics or glass or cardboard. So what we need to do is really be honest about getting away from plastic uh, because it's not working for our recycling system. What that means is we're seeing a huge increase in costs for our recycling across the region. So uh, in Boston, for instance, and in Western Mass, uh, Casella and Waste Management are charging cities and towns uh, $145 a ton tipping fee for the recycling. The waste disposal, of course, is still also expensive. So that's $100 a ton for tipping fees across New England. So that we're seeing this recycling, you know, we're realizing recycling is not working. Um, at the same time, we're seeing these huge cost increase. And that was pre-COVID. Now COVID has hit. And we're seeing that residential communities are, are, are having increases. Cities and towns are having increases in the cost of uh, their recycling at the same time as they're having increases in the amount of trash that's being produced by residences. So what we need to do is really figure out how to solve this financial problem and fix our recycling at the same time. Um, plastic companies were very quick to jump in and to say to everybody, plastic is the solution to COVID. That is not the case. Uh, folks don't get COVID from surfaces. You get COVID person to person. That's why we wear our masks. That's why we wash our hands. So. We need to um, make sure we get back into reuse and we need to really focus on this opportunity as we move into our new normal. We want our new normal to be one of safe reuse systems, not single use disposable plastic. And, and then, Kirsty, oh. one, one of the things I wanted to jump in about in particular is that, you know, you mentioned right off the top that China is no longer taking the, the plastic. And one of the things I just wanted to kind of reiterate with that in mind that I think sometimes there's the resentment towards China for not taking. The, the issue isn't that they're not taking our, that anymore. It's the fact that we shouldn't be shipping this anyways, right? I mean, I think that's the, the that's yeah. the one thing that I think it kind of gets lost in all of this. That, well, they're not taking it, so it's their fault, right? No, I mean, it boils yeah. down no. to. I, yeah, I would never want to imply that. What happened is that China said, "Gee, uh, we're we we'll, they will take our plastic still." Uh, actually, when we say we're not taking it, the reason that they're not accepting the plastic is because we haven't got it to it sorted to a. a um, pure enough level so that they can use it in their markets. In other words, if you have less than half a percent of contamination in your load of plastics, they'll gladly accept it. But our plastic is probably 25% contamination. So we're not doing even close to a good enough job at sorting and creating a material that can be used in a circular economy. This isn't the fault of any other country. Um, in fact, uh, were I any of the countries in the world, I would not accept the West plastic and, and paper um, recycling because it is so highly contaminated and valueless. You, you can't recycle that filmy plastic. Only number one and number two rigid containers of a certain size uh, actually have a market. So that's certainly not the fault of any other country except for ours. Exactly. And that, that's just one of those things I want to reiterate to folks, because I feel like sometimes that gets lost in translation sometimes. Mm -hmm. But but with that, so talk to that, to the local level, to the, the boots on the ground, if you will. Tell me about those steps. What are those things that really need to be done? So we're seeing that, you know, of course, the waste problem is bigger than just the plastic, but all of it does affect the plastic and work in plastic problem. I mean, I do want to mention, I don't want to go into it today, but plastic, of course, is made of oil and gas and very, very polluting from at every step of the way. So that's another whole, and terrible for the climate. So that's another whole reason to avoid plastic. But our waste problem is also terrible for the client, climate. So in other words, um, landfills release a lot of methane. Incinerators, of course, are really releasing a lot of toxic gas. So when we deal with our waste problem, we're dealing with toxicity, public health, and climate, as well as an economic problem. Um, the opportunities on the ground are huge. We're seeing that uh, we're seeing municipalities taking really meaningful action. Uh, eight different cities and towns in Massachusetts have banned 
single serve plastic water bottles for water. Um, what that means is that they're saying, these are ending up on the side of our roads, we're not putting up with it anymore. Falmouth, Massachusetts just banned nip bottles, the little nippers that, uh, have, that have alcohol in them. They're ending up on the side of the road and they do not get recycled in our system because they're too small, they fall through the cracks. So we're seeing that local action take root and really make a big difference. And we also saw before COVID, we saw some really meaningful statewide action. Um, Vermont passed a straws only on request, polystyrene ban and plastic grocery bag ban. Um, Maine passed a polystyrene and grocery bag ban. Connecticut passed a polystyrene and grocery bag ban. So we're seeing state level action also happen here that is really meaningful, but we need to take it to the next level. We need to get it to that next level. And so when you say that, though, how do we get it to the next level? I know we're going to be talking with Representative Ascolo in just a, a moment, but tell me, from your thoughts, your minds, your ideas, and I know you're in all these meetings and conversations, like we said, all day, every day right now. So with that, how, how do we get it to the, I mean, I know we, we saw your schedule. We know how it works. Tell, tell me, how do we get it to the next level? Well, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. First of all, you want to make sure that you know what you're talking about and that you're promoting good programs, whatever they are, and that you have the policy right. Uh, CLF can be a great resource for that. There are other great resources like Sierra Club and Surf Rider, um, Mass Municipal Association. A lot of folks have compiled a lot of this good information and so that you can look into it. Um, the next step after you know what's going on is to pick what you're good at and what you want to do. Grassroots movements uh, take a lot of different players. There's the guy who writes the great letters to the editor. There's the guy who shows up at the meetings, pu local public meetings or regional meetings. There's the guy who gets everybody else to those meetings. There's the person who um, who really does the deep dive and writes comments and comment letters to the agency over and over and shows up at those. All of those people, the person who knows the guy, the reporter at the, at the local paper, you know, um, all of those people um, really make a huge difference in getting this done. So think about what you like to do and take action. And I think Rep Sicolo can talk about the different ways she's seen people take action in her district, the different ways she's seen people take action across the state in Massachusetts. Um, and it's make, it makes a tremendous difference. That's the only way real change happens. Excellent. Well, th thank you, Kirsty. Thanks so much. I, I do. I want to keep us moving because I'm already seeing in the chat. I want to say thank you to everybody again that's tuning in. There's a lot of great questions already coming in, which is phenomenal. That's going to kind of move us along, really, because I would love to get to those uh, questions um, as the show kind of goes on. But with that in mind, I do want to bring in um, Representative Zicolo right now. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for taking time out to join us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great and very glad to be here. Tyler, thank you for hosting and Conservation Law Foundation. Uh, this is terrific. Um, I'm so glad that you invited me to speak today. Excellent. So very similar to how we kind of started things off with uh, Kirsty. Give us a little bit of your background, some of the things that your areas of focus really as a state rep. So I'm a brand new um, state rep. I, this is my first session and my district is Lexington and part of Woburn. And I like to say that representatives really reflect their district. And, and one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this is because of my community and the advocates that I have within my community. But I have a, um, a 25 year history in local and regional government. So I think that um, just even though I'm new to the legislature, um, I come to this with a lot of experience and involvement and in, with uh, working with diverse communities across the board. I was uh, a uh, three-term president of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which is the regional planning council for Boston and 101 cities and towns. Uh, sort of the majority of Massachusetts is in the MAPC planning region. And I was also on um, the Mass Municipal Association board for, for three years. Uh, so got to see what was happening on the regional and state le statewide level. Uh, and, and of course, professionally, I was um, an assistant town administrator for the town of Hudson for 20 years. Uh, and that was also before I started getting uh, involved in local politics on the planning board and then on the select board for almost two terms. So uh, so I came to the job with um, tremendous interest in helping cities and towns um, sort of advance sound environmental policy because the environment is clearly one of the top priorities in my district, uh, as is education and social equity, I would say, social justice. Uh, so. Um, 
with thanks to Kirsty, who came to me early on in, in my tenure this term, uh, it was really her idea um, uh, to begin to establish a zero waste caucus at the legislature. And I was incredibly excited about this idea because I understand that, you know, the legislative process in Massachusetts is, is it can be daunting. We have on, in a typical legislative session, at least 6,500 bills get filed. And I think that's something that advocates often don't know that there's just such a huge number of bills that we're dealing with. They might see a piece of legislation and say, gee, this is a no brainer. Why can't the legislature get that done? But you know that one bill is competing against so many other interests and so many other maybe similar bills even. Um, and you know we have to vet maybe 15 different bills on the same exact topic and try to figure out how to you know make some sense of them and improve them. So um, in order for us to be a little bit more effective and strategic, working with our fellow legislators in caucuses has proven to be a really good strategy to um, really put a, a spotlight on key pieces of legislation and advance um, advance our goals. So in February this year, we started the Zero Waste Caucus right before COVID uh, started to begin to shut down the economy. I was going to say that, that kind of throws a wrench into things right off the bat when you first <laughs> launch it and you say we're ready to go and then someone kind of pulls the plug essentially, right? <laughs> it was terrible, terrible timing, but we did have our first meeting and uh, you know what's really exciting is we are um, bi bicameral and um, and bipartisan. And on the Senate side, we have uh, Senator Jason Lewis as the co-chair, and I am the co-chair on the House side. And right off the bat, we had 31 members sign up, which is great. And I think we're going to continue to grow because all legislators really are, are hearing from their communities about the problems that Kirsty outlined with um, an inability to dispose of waste and recycling getting so much more expensive. And, um, and I think, you know, we are also understanding through uh, COVID, how what a crisis um, the public health impacts are, and you know six out of seven of the incinerators in Massachusetts, for instance, are located in environmental justice neighborhoods, and that's really unacceptable. The the, the toxicity and the air quality impacts that these incinerators have on the lungs and and overall health and well being of our most vulnerable residents is unacceptable and. And that's something that I think my district, it's a very well-off district and we're very cognizant of, um, you know, our, our environmental footprint. We're trying to figure out how do we do better and, um, you know, recognizing the injustice and, and working to stop it. So, um, Michelle, with that, so our, one of the questions I have to kind of piggyback on what Kirsty was talking about and kind of where you're going right now, just talk to the, the, the uh, I guess, the how do I put this right? Kind of the amount of power that local officials really have, because I think that's one thing that folks might not necessarily know. Say, yes, I I can separate my trash. I could do this, but talk to the the actual power that kind of local elected officials have, especially with something yeah, like this. It's amazing. It's not just the the local elected officials. It's also um, the advocates, individuals. Um, you know, so one of the things that inspires me every single day is a group of uh, citizens uh, called the Lexington Green Team, and um, the Green Teams plural. They started forming um, out of parent organizations in the schools uh, about eight years ago now in Lexington. And uh, I think we have a green team at every single school now, certainly at every grammar school. And they started working in coalition with, um, you know, Moms Demand Action and other environmental groups. We have uh, Lexington uh, Conservation Commission and um, Sustainable Lexington. And there's a there's a whole list of um, local groups that sort of jumped in together to help them take action to do very specific things. And so one of the things they did is lobby the school committee early on to have a better policy for how waste was managed in the schools. And that was extremely effective. And then they went on to um, actually lobbying our town meeting. So Lexington has a, a town meeting form of government. We have 200 elected officials that are representatives essentially to town meeting. Um, which is our legislative body. And the green teams brought uh, three very wonderful bylaws. We have a, ba a plastic bag ban, but we also did a straw ban and a polystyrene ban. And they teamed up with the Girl Scouts, and, and very effective to have youth voices in the process. Very um, 
impressive how uh, what is what an incredible majority they got for positive votes on each of these action items that they brought to town meeting. Uh, you know, people might have predicted it would pass by the skin of its teeth, and it was passed almost unanimously. All three of these bylaws, which were really uh, amazing to see, and and some of the effects that they've been able to have. You know, imagine they've been able to get the catering company uh, for the school district to eliminate the polystyrene trays, and they estimate that's you know four hundred thousand trays a year. And now the, the you uh, paint that picture cardboard. when you say that. Well, I mean, we were talking about that offline, right? If you think of four hundred thousand yeah. trays, stack those up. I mean, we're talking buildings of heights, right? So you really have to paint that picture for us because that, that's just remarkable to think about that that waste, right? That's right. That's right. And so, you know, I would say that um, as a legislator, we take very seriously the citizens that reach out to us. And, you know, if your mayor or your select board or your city council or your town meeting members are reaching out to you saying, you know, we want change, we want action, you take note of that as a legislator. And it's extremely uh, important to have those voices because, of course, you know, on the other side of things, when we're trying to do things like a statewide plastic bag ban, you have the retailers association saying, well, now, wait a minute, you know, we have to, we, we're not sure how this is going to impact our operations in the stores that we run. And, and you know, so you, you have, I, I um, was just going to ask that. I know it will get us off topic a little bit, but kind of give me the, the state of the, the plastic bag ban right now, because it is at a, an interesting, uh, interesting point in general right now, really. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's wonderful, that, uh, and Kirsty will remember, maybe I don't have the exact And Kirsty, feel so free many, to jump in on this as well. <laughs> so many communities have already passed a plastic bag ban. It was, it's now at the point where the, um, the legislature, both branches, is considering different um, ba bag ban versions. And I think that we're seeing some forward progress. We have some hope in that we will be able to get this across the finish line in the near term. But I think that's only because so many of our communities took local action first. Now the sticking points are really trying to determine if we can charge a fee for bags, which makes compliance much higher. If you have to pay five cents to, you know, if you don't remember your bags, you, you just are a little bit more likely to to bring your bag, but of course there's concerns around what that does to you know low moderate income residents and how that would impact them. And um, the other issue is these bylaws that some communities have crafted are so effective that many communities don't want to give up the, the language in their bylaw. And if we have a statewide statute, then we have to figure out how to make it as strong as possible that's, that, that we can all be comfortable with, but not impact the local bylaws already in place in a negative way. And so that's the struggle. Now we're trying to figure out exactly um, how to do this effectively in a way that would be fair. But I, I really do think that we're at that point where we'll be able to get this done in, in the near future. Thanks. And Christy, I'll give you an opportunity as well to kind of piggyback on that because I, I saw you shaking your head and nodding. I want to give you a chance to chime in on that part as well. But that's definitely true. We're, I think that we're at the point now where uh, Massachusetts for sure is going to follow its neighbors and, and pass a, um, a bag ban across the state. I think that the bags are the tip of the iceberg. They're kind of an entry level um, environmentalism for an anti-plastic work for a lot of people. Um, and so I think that really uh, all the states in New England should go bigger than that because I, I not only because that's partly my job, but also because I think that folks are ready for that. They know how dangerous plastic is. They know how dangerous plastic is for our climate. Um, and it's also costing us a lot of money in our trash and recycling. So why would we let all this lousy plastic that's not recyclable in the system when we can ban not only the polystyrene, the plastic bags, but let's start really getting rid of things like the wipes, the plastic wipes that are clogging our uh, our drains and our sewer systems. You know, like there's a whole there's a whole list of materials that Europe has started to ban that I think all the states should start to consider so that we can clean up our recycling and save ourselves a lot of money. And Repsicola, I know I cut you off. I apologize for that. You were continuing on with that, talking about the, the caucus and kind of walking through that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to meet a ton, but we've already uh, been able to put our comments in, for instance, to DEP's Solid Waste Master Plan, which, you know, it really helps for them to receive a letter from a, from a whole legislative caucus with quite a few signatories. 
on the letter saying, you know, we want stronger um, statewide planning documents and, and stronger goals for reducing waste. And I think that's extremely helpful. And we're convening now to talk about, you know, the budget cycle, what areas do we need to, you know, invest in to make sure that we can have the infrastructure needed to, to reduce waste, and then what legislative actions might we be able to take. And, uh, you know, we're looking at things like pay as you throw, or um, sometimes it's called uh, smart, save money and reduce trash. Um, we're looking at an expanded or modernized bottle bill. Uh, of course, the statewide plastic bag ban. Producer responsibility, one of the most important things we can do. It's a very, it's much more complex to, um, to get that across the finish line, but we have to be talking about that now and really requiring the manufacturers who produce these goods to be part of the solution. Um, the expansion of organic composting and, uh, of course, toxics reductions. Right now, we have a lot of items that are already banned from the waste stream, but they, there's not enough enforcement. So these items are still going into um, landfills and incinerators, and they're toxic. And so, you know, better enforcement, better public awareness building so that people know not to throw those items into the waste stream. Those things are kind of critical. And that, that requires both funding as well as potentially additional legislation to expand what items are, um, are banned and to require a higher level of um, DEP enforcement. So, you know, the caucus is... Um, you know, we are very new, uh, so we will be listening to our members, getting all of their best ideas. Uh, some new ideas, one of the things that I'm kind of excited about trying to explore is the idea that maybe we would have um, restaurants be required to ask and charge for something like plastic disposable silverware. So, you know, all those takeout lunches you get that you don't need the silverware and they toss in three three bags of silverware. and if they if they had to charge 10 or 25 cents for silverware and they had to ask you do you want silverware i think that would be a game changer and um might even be something that that uh restaurants would be willing to collaborate with us on because perhaps they um you know could keep some portion of the fee and so suddenly they've got a you know something covering that expense that they already have um you know throw they're throwing that expense out the door so those are the kinds of things that we have to start thinking about, creative ideas for um, reducing all of the, uh, the single-use items that, that we use every day and, and uh, need to get away from. You know, I'll just share one other thing. The, our green team has, everyone who's an environmentalist knows, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. We all know the, the three R's. Our green team in Lexington has expanded, expanded it to seven R's, and I thought it'd be fun to share that with all of you. Um, they have, their seven are refuse, so don't, you know, don't accept the, the silverware, refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, repurpose, rot, and recycle, which I think is great. That's excellent. I love that. I love that. So before we open the floor to questions um, to the, the kind of the general public, I see so many of them coming in right now, which is just fantastic to see. So keep them coming. That's what the part of the show is for now, really. Um, but I want to l remind everybody in order to do that, just comment in the box directly next to the player itself if you're on our website. And if you happen to be on Facebook, again, the comment box below the player itself, the same way you would comment on just about any video. Go ahead and add your questions there. We're monitoring that. We're taking those, and we're going to be kind of sifting through them and bringing them up. The other thing I want to remind everybody about that we are going to be sending out a follow-up email with all the resources that we're kind of discussing here today. So you saw in a... Our representative Sokolo's presentation right there that there were a lot of different links in there. We're going to be sending those out to folks afterwards. They're excellent, a lot of great information in there that you can really sink your teeth into. So we're going to be sending that out as well, kind of post-show. So be on the lookout for that. So before I jump in, any kind of closing thoughts in terms of regular discussion right now, uh, Kirsty, or should we just dive right into the, the, the question and answer portion right now? I, my only thought would be that, you know, uh, the the list that the rep just put on is fantastic. Whether you're interested in composting, which is a, about a third of our waste is food scraps, whether you're interested in decreasing plastic, there's lots of communities that are taking advantage of that, and there's a lot of work to be done regionally and statewide on that. Whether you're interested in stopping a landfill or an incinerator, and whatever role you want to play in that, get involved. You know, call us, email us. 
call your rep, call your senator, call your local officials, find out what's happening in your town. And the more involved you are, even if you're just making a phone call once a week, it makes a huge difference because the reps and senators and your local officials are hearing from the waste companies. They're hearing from the plastic corporations. You need to make sure that you're, you're heard too, in whichever way you feel comfortable doing that. And uh, I want to just mention that on your side of things, uh, Michelle, just you do hear those calls, right? I mean, that that's the one thing that I, I think that some people forget, like, well, it doesn't really matter if I call. You do hear those calls. You do see those emails, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. The, they're, um, that's what I focus on the most is when my constituents reach out to me and tell me what's important, you know, to them. So we hear from, you know, industry on one side, but whenever I, I have a citizen sending an email or even postcards. It's funny, that's so old fashioned, but um, you know, the email volume that many of us get can be hundreds and hundreds a day. So, you know, as a new rep, I have one spectacular legislative aide, but he's only one person. And the two of us are trying to read two mailboxes full of uh, just an incredible volume of email. So when we get postcards, sometimes it's, it's like, wow, okay. These are, you know, someone cared enough to send me a little postcard. So, so those can be helpful too, and phone calls. Um, you know, even just leaving a voicemail, saw this, you know, saw this piece of legislation, hope you support it is a useful, you know, piece of data for us to, to be aware of. And, and we love it when constituents get in touch. Excellent. Love it. All right. So with that in mind, we're going to jump into kind of the, the question portion of the, the program again, invite even more questions to be asked. So go right ahead. And this is what usually happens is we have a bunch. We try to get to as many as humanly possible in kind of the allotted time. But if we don't, we promise we'll be following up as well. So with that in mind, the first question that kind of came up uh, was kind of in regards to shipping trash elsewhere. And this one came from Michelle. It said, recent news said that we're now sending our plastic waste to African countries and others. How can we advocate against this? Um, Kirsty, I'll kind of throw this to you based on kind of our discussion earlier. How do you advocate about, against kind of trash and um, plastic waste being sent to other countries outside of just China? Well, of course, uh, you know, our um, our economy is very complicated, so there aren't easy answers to any of these questions, unfortunately. But what I would say is going back to the R's that, that Repsicola was mentioning earlier, that refuse, if you don't use it, it's not going to be trash and it's not going to get shipped overseas. If you ban it, if we ban polystyrene, then it won't be shipped anywhere. Um, and then also, as you set up programs, really evaluating whether they create circularity and sustainability. In other words, we need to do a better job in every state in New England at looking at when we say it's getting recycled, what does that mean? Where are these materials really going? Um, there's a huge problem, for instance, with uh, clothes that are being recycled, not actually getting recycled, but sent to Africa. Some of them are getting reused and recycled, but some of them are ending up in African landfills. And clothes are about 60% plastic now. So that's an enormous problem. You want to make sure if you set up a recycling program or reuse program in your community that you know where these materials are going, that you're dealing with reputable companies and you know where they're going. Right now, because of the monopoly in many of our um, recycling systems, we are not seeing that kind of control and transparency that we should be. So uh, to me, the, one of the best ways to really drill down on that, other than banning the plastic and phasing out single plastic entirely, which is really important, uh, is also working with the agency in your state and saying, I need to know how much is actually being recycled and then how much is being shipped overseas and how much is being landfilled and incinerated. In New England, it's mostly landfilled and incinerated because of where we're located in the world, but we still need to be keeping a really close eye on that. Excellent. And Michelle, I know you want to chime in on this as well. Sure, sure. Um, Kirsty's recommendations are all spot on, but I would also add that uh, municipalities have contracts with waste management companies and they don't control the waste management company, but every three to five years they go out to bid for new contracts and it would not hurt to speak to your local officials and encourage them instead of just doing a low bid um, procurement, you know, which, which takes the lowest price. They could actually uh, require some components in their contract with their uh, their recycling hauler and their trash hauler 
asking about where they dispose of the waste. Do they incinerate it? Do they ship it you know, to another state overseas? And evaluating the companies that respond to that RFP based on uh, the quality of what they do with the end product um, and how environmentally sensitive they treat it. And you know, are they looking to take the toxics how, what, what kind of a job are they doing removing the toxic, toxics from the waste stream, et cetera? And I think those are questions that we rarely have asked as local elected officials because this issue just hasn't become front and center for us. But as we are more and more aware of the problems associated with you know, improper waste disposal, that is a, a local action that we could be taking going forward. Excellent. The, the next question, I think, is an important one that I want to jump to, and this kind of ties in, um, Repsicola, with something that you were talking about earlier, meeting with the Girl Scouts, but this one came from Nelly. Um, aside from legislative action and other meaningful initiatives, to what degree do you think we need to uh, integrate learning about this into our education system? So I'm going to start with you, uh, Representative Zicola, and then I, I will also turn it over to you, Kirsty. Now that's probably the most important thing we can do. What's what's happening in my district is the kids in grammar school are going home and telling their parents, you know, mom, you shouldn't be throwing that away. You need to compost that. Dad, don't don't put that in that bin. You know, <laughs> so the kids, the green teams that are really working on educating the students and they're out learning more and more about this, and and then that that information is filtering up to the adults, which is absolutely wonderful. But you know, we all need to learn to set um, lifelong habits that are responsible and it starts with youth and um, it's it can be a complex area and you know there's a lot to learn about you know which numbered plastics go where and and um, can the caps go into the recycling or not and and what about these different types of papers are they truly recyclable and um, so so you know we we have our program in, in Lexington the DPW puts out you know really a detailed information to every household every year about recycling, and that's very, very helpful. Um, and because that information has sort of a central um, repository for um, communication, uh, whenever we do something new, we're able to sign on new people. So for instance, we're working on um, townwide curbside um, composting. We don't have it yet as an official um, municipal service. But because so many households are, are uh, teaming up with um, Black Earth, uh, one of the companies that does this, you know, you now can get the bins. You can pick the bins up, I believe, at our DPW. But you know, there's again, it's it's all about communication and education to the, the community at large, and and that's really important. I say, Kirsty, I wanted to invite you to, to jump in on that on board. I mean, <laughs> Representative Scola just answered that like perfectly, I feel like, but I want to give you the opportunity to also kind of chime in. <laughs> she answered it perfectly. And I also love her idea about contracts, too. That's really an important pressure point that we can use that they're answering her early, the earlier question. Uh, I can just say that my 13 year old is, was looking for tights that didn't have any plastic in them that were made of uh, recycled bamboo the other day. So yeah, definitely our kids are going to be a huge influence on the older generations, but also they're getting this and they're really tired of seeing what a terrible job we're doing managing our world. So yeah, definitely teaching them is really crucial. Excellent. All right. Well, we're getting a, a lot of questions about in regards to kind of specific items and um, specifics, what, what we need to do for just recycling at home itself. So, uh, Kirstie, w one of the questions, you know, kind of going back to what you were discussing earlier about, you know, sorting and the percentage that our plastics are, are really just dirty, to say the least. Well, one of the questions from Deb came in and said, do we need to wash recyclables before putting them in our blue bins? Like you just <laughs> mentioned a few seconds ago, Repsicolo. Um, if, if so, just a quick rinse or do we need to get rid of all food plastic uh, particles excuse me so talk to that a little bit because I think there is some um, confusion as to what's clean plastic what's what's dirty what, what at yeah. what point do we say okay this is good to recycle right so I'll answer I, I'll answer the question to include other questions that I bet are also on your list Tyler to try and make this easier for you so um, recyclables all need to be clean that does mean really washing it, not washing it necessarily with soap, but getting the actual visible particles out. So you don't want to wash it so that you can eat out of it. You want to wash it so that there's no peanut butter left adhering to the inside of the jar. That's really important. You don't want chunks of tuna fish in, in the can still. So a brush is probably their best way to go. You don't need to use soap. Um, 
What that means for other materials, for instance, I get this question every time, pizza boxes. Pizza boxes not only cannot have pizza on them, but anytime there's grease that's for bigger than a quarter, please tear that section of the pizza box out and throw it into the trash. That's the standard, that's the standard rule for pizza boxes. Um, if as far as the value of the materials and making sure that you keep things sorted as well as possible, one of the problems with single stream, as I said before, is glass getting into the cardboard, the different kinds of plastic getting into each other. So the best systems that, that, that actually retain the value of the materials and can make the most money for their cities and towns are deep sort systems. Wellesley has one, where I live in Sturbridge has one. What it means is you go there, your corrugated cardboard is in one bin, your number one plastic's in another, your number two plastic is in another, your metals are in another one, your mixed paper is in another. Each of those materials then has actual value, and then your glass is separate too. So the glass isn't getting into the paper and destroying the paper mill. The little bits of plastic aren't getting into the uh, into the cardboard, etc. Um, so when you're looking at a single stream system, that means that all of that stuff's going into the bin. You're not going to get a good a price for those materials, which is the problem, and there's less oversight and it's a lot easier to throw stuff in that shouldn't belong because you don't have those clearly labeled separated bins. But the general rule of thumb is, and, and take a look at the MassDEP IQ system, uh, the MassDEP recycling IQ kit is a pretty good standard no matter what state you live in for single stream because these things are most, they're mostly the same rules. Though check with your town and your state in case they have some other specific rules. The general rule of thumb is cardboard uh, paper, metal, meaning cans and you know aluminum or, or tin, what we think of as tin cans, uh, glass, and then number one and number two plastics. So soda bottles, milk jugs, that kind of plastic. And all of it clean. Yes, please scrub it out so there's no peanut butter. I guess is a is the is a real uh, a real torturous material for a lot of recycling managers. So get that peanut butter out of there. <laughs> And I have to give a shout out to my local town, Norfolk, Mass, because they also have a wonderful transfer station with every single kind of bin imaginable. So, yeah, th th there that's, are some really yeah, great ones that do a great well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it's a lot of work for those folks. So, yeah, yeah, definitely a shout out to anyone who's managing those facilities. But that's the best way to retain value and to weather these difficult markets that we're seeing now. Excellent. One of the, the next questions kind of came in talking about alternatives, um, and especially specifically in the restaurant industry. So this one came from Anna. Now, can you share alternatives to plastic takeaway containers for our local restaurants? How do you feel about uh, compostable eating utensils and cups? Now, going back to what you were, everybody has been noticing, obviously, the amount of trash um, for our you know individual families and homes. A lot of that is because of takeout from restaurants. And so with that in mind, this kind of kind of goes hand in hand with what you, we were just talking about. But uh, really, what are some of those alternatives that restaurants can probably take actions for with? And this is open ended for whoever would like to jump on board, really. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. well, so, yeah, so, oh, you first, Michelle. I was just going to say that, um, yeah, you do have to be careful of the compostable ones. Some of them are aligned with um, a chemical that's unsafe. So um, I think we do have to do more education for the restaurant industry and for the public to know um, whether or not those items, even though they say that they're compostable, whether or not they're actually safe to put into composting facilities that, you know, that can break them down. And usually you can't put those types of materials in home composting uh, facilities. It's really... Uh, the, those are the types of items have to go to an industrial composting because you need the heat that's generated from the, from industrial compost sites to really break it down properly. So they're a little tricky and they're not really ideal. And this sort of highlights the more the complexity of the issue that we're all facing. And I think long term, what we need to do is begin to develop some kind of system where whatever the takeout container is that's used, maybe we have you know five or ten different um, takeout containers and they're all returnable. And you know, there's an industrial wash facility somewhere and they get sent back out to the, the, the restaurants and everybody kind of uses the same standard. I mean, that would be my dream world, but I know we're a long way from getting there, but that would be ideal so that we're not ever actually having to burn, incinerate, or attempt to compost something that's lined with maybe a chemical that's, that's not safe. 
I, I think Repsicola is going to put me out of a job because that was pretty much exactly <laughs> the answer. Um, I would also I would also add to that that if you use something and you have to dispose of it, or, or if you use something and you have to recycle it or compost it, you're still using more resources than if you can refill it. So we want to see refillables the way we used to for Coke and Pepsi and other and other drinks when, in the 70s when, when, when I was a kid. I mean, not you, Tyler, but when I was a kid. And, then, and we also want to see, as the rep said, we want to see refillables for takeout. Um, there's a company called Useful that's looking into doing this for coffee cups where there'd be kiosks and you could drop your coffee cup off. Um, you know, or you could uh, bring it back to your cafe and get another one. Um, we're look. There's also um, a group in North Carolina that's trying to find the ideal reusable pizza box so that you can have your pizza. Because that one, you know, as I said, people ask me about pizza all the time for some reason. Um, so, <laughs> well, during COVID nineteen, there's been a lot of pizza being eaten. Let I me mean, let's go out well and be serious for a second. <laughs> It might be because they can tell just by looking at me that I make excellent pizza. I make excellent <laughs> pizza. So that's it. But, but the, point is, the point is that these reusables are the best way to go because making something once and reusing it 50 or 100 times uses much less water, much less labor, much less energy, and much less re raw raw resources, you know, the raw materials than making a cup and then making another one for every day of the week. So, you know, that reuse is always the best option. And also, as the rep pointed out, if you don't have access to commercial composting where the piles get nice and warm, these materials aren't going to break down. If there's PFAS and other chemicals coating it, then that's going to make a problem. And also, most people in the state still don't have access to composting. So many of us, like I do, can put it in their backyard. I'm not very scientific about it. I just throw it in the woods. That's a good thing to do if you're in a rural area. That's not going to work in the greater Boston area. You cannot do that. You'll have a pest problem. So we need to set up good composting programs. I think we should just skip the step of compostable foodware and move right into reusables. Another good resource for people is an organization called Upstream that we partner with. They work nationally on these programs. They're fantastic. And there are lots of good ideas for how we skip right over compostables and go right to reusables. So I don't think I don't think it's as far away as you think. It's really something that will save all of us a lot of money um, in the long run. So we should be doing it sooner rather than later. Excellent. I love that. I love that. I'm like literally taking notes as we go. Like, okay, I have to visit upstream immediately after this. This is great. Uh, so the the next question, kind of going back to something we talked discussed a little bit earlier um, about sorting and local towns don't necessarily have as many issues, but uh, trash companies sometimes do. And this is came from Mary Rose said in many towns, recyclables are sorted at the curb, but combined by solid waste companies. Why is dual stream waste collection so difficult for trash companies in particular? Um, I'll start with you, Kirsty. there, um, and then we'll transition to you, Rep. Socolo, as well. Um, you know, none of this is difficult, right? I mean, it's difficult. It's very difficult to set up systems and programs and to educate folks so everybody knows everybody's on the same page. Change is a little bit difficult. But none of this is rocket science. What we're really talking about when you talk about um, the, the mixing of recyclables or mixing of waste is money. Uh, waste companies, if they can put everything into one truck and then back it up and bury it or burn it, that's what they want to do. We're seeing, um, we're seeing proposals across New England. Uh, one for the South Coast, and then there's a, actually a, a facility in Maine where they want to take all the trash, pick out some of the recyclables, uh, get some, uh, process it to get some of the main uh, methane out of it, and then uh, and then make it into little uh, chunks that can be burned. That's how waste companies make money: is by doing as little as possible and educating as little as possible and monitoring the system as little as possible. Um, that facility in Maine, FiberRight, is shut down now because it's not a marketable or profitable system to try and resell these materials if you mix them all together. But that's kind of always the dream, is that there'll be some silver bullet technology that will allow everyone the convenience of throwing in everything into one bin and the waste company will still make money from it. 
that's not workable. It's a, it, it uses too many resources, it wastes too many resources, um, and you're never going to be able to sell those materials for any value. We're never gonna create a circular economy with, with that kind of thinking. Separation is the way to go. So it's not that waste companies can't set up two trucks to pick up the cardboard and paper, which is how dual stream is usually done, and then the containers in another contain, you know, container, or but they can't have sucks trucks with separators in them, which we've also seen. None of this is rocket science. This is all very doable. Um, we're seeing systems where textiles are being picked up in the region in purple bags. So on your recycling day, you can take a per pink or purple bag and throw your textiles in it, your clothes and your old toys and your old sheets and curtains and put them out at the curb. And then a van will just go along the recycling route every Tuesday or whenever your recycling day is and pick those up as well. That works. It, it makes money. You know, those those types of systems work great. We just need to insist that waste companies are actually giving us the services and contracts like the rep set are a perfect way to do that, are actually giving us the services we need to reuse, recycle, and compost our materials, not pretend to be doing it and then throw it all in a landfill or an incinerator. Excellent. All right. We, we've got just about time for one last question, and this is a loaded one that I think is going to lead us into a lot more discussion, either within the chat or on the uh, just on our Facebook page, uh, all over social media and by way of emails. If you could, one question came in from Judith, and this could be, again, a very long science project that we could discuss right now. But I think from an overarching standpoint, if we could, how do plastics impact the climate? If you give me the Cliff Notes version, um, really t take me through it. How, how is it hurting our, our climate really right now? Kirsty, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, all right, the, as, as always, this is the kind of question that I could answer in an hour and I, and I have done so. So I, I will be as reasonable understanding that we're not getting to everything. Uh, so almost all plastics are made of gas and oil, 99% of them. Uh, the more we pull that gas and oil out of the oil, of the soil, right? That keep the oil in the soil. The more we pull the, that petroleum out of the earth, boom, you have a climate problem. You've taken that carbon out of the system that it was in and putting it up into the air. That's number one. Uh, number two, the fracking that we're seeing, which is most of the most of the drilling we're doing in the United States now, that fracking is horrible for the climate because there are tremendous leaks constantly um, from the wells. And, and once the wells are abandoned, even they leak for ages, um, and they create horrible lagoons of poisonous um, water left over, toxic water that's left over. Um, so it's terrible for the climate, and it's also terrible for the environment that way. Then you have to create a refinery, um, which is a very energy intensive process to refine this gas or oil so it can be used for other purposes and take all the toxics out of that and, and put those toxic materials again into the environment. Then you have to create what are called nurdles out of, you know, out of that gas and oil to make plastic bits, also a very polluting process. Then you take those nurdles and make them into uh, a piece of plastic. Uh, then you, end up using it for a very short amount of time, single use plastic, use it for a day, a plastic bag, use it for 20 minutes, whatever the average is. And then uh, you end up burning it, which is terrible for the climate, um, or you end up burying it into the uh, into a landfill where it's leaking a leachate, toxic leachate from the plastic. Um, not to mention the toxicity from the incinerator. Burning some kinds of plastic is the recipe for dioxin, which is one of the most dangerous chemicals known to man. Uh, or the plastic ends up in our soil, rivers, oceans. Much of the plastic ends up in our soil, rivers, oceans. That plastic is also um, very detrimental to the operation of the oceans, the actual living biosphere of the ocean. Um, it is meaning that the ocean is not able to absorb as much carbon, that the life in the ocean that absorbs carbon is not as functional. The plankton, for instance, we're now finding as pieces of plastic in it. Um, and then furthermore, looking at the whole system, so, that, so each part of the process for using plastic is terrible for the environment and climate. The, the other part of this is that we are right now subsidizing our oil and gas industry 
to the tune of tens of billions of dollars every year. I forget. It depends how you it depends how you evaluate the number, but these companies would not be in business in the United States if we weren't giving them I think it's 75 billion dollars a year. Um, if we are if we were not doing that, they would not be in business. But also if we stopped this huge influx of single-use plastic, they would not be in business. So in other words, the oil and gas companies that are pushing to make sure that our uh, cars and homes are heated and, and run by their material for a while, the petroleum, they would be out of business if we could get rid of all of this plastic. So in other words, we are allowing an industry that is probably going to cause the earth to shut down and really cr create a system where we're going to have horrendous um, weather events like what we're seeing in California right now with the horrible um, forest fires as well as hurricanes. The hurricanes are much more extreme than they ever have been. We're going to see that kind of horrible uh, I don't even know a word, you know, these horrible, horribly expensive and also devastating to the communities and to the human health of the people around them events until we shut down or the oil and gas industry across the board and transition off this material. So anything we do to put a single cent into their pockets, anytime you buy a plastic cup or use a plastic bag because that's the only way you can buy your fruit, um, you are supporting an industry that is very literally possibly going to cause our way of life to actually collapse upon itself. Kirsty, so, I don't like, know how you just did this in five minutes, but <laughs> that was remarkable. You took it literally from end to end. I was like, this is like, thank you very much. <laughs> plastic. So please avoid plastic. Keep your pizza at home or get a reusable pizza box. Uh, and, but then also... Stop using plastic coffee cups and stop, you know, whatever we can do and then take action in whatever way you are comfortable with doing because people like Repsicola are dying to hear from you so that they can take action on your behalf and they want to be in your corner, but they need you to be in their corner first too. So that's, so it's not, it's not all doom and gloom, Tyler. We're going to be okay. <laughs> we just have to. We just have to get off our butts and take some action. You got to do our part. That's the the only way yeah. to yeah. put it in. Repsicola, uh, you just kind of your closing thoughts as well. Um, as a whole, as we kind of wrap up the day and and say our goodbyes, if you will. That was such a, a great question, and Kirsty's answer was fantastic. She crushed it. Um, but I, I also want to just put it in some context of, again and remind people in, in the considering what we're dealing with today in the middle of a pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all of the single stream plastics that are that are not being uh, recycled, when you know, even though we think they are, we wish they are, they're going into those landfills and they're going into our incinerators. And uh, you know, I, I know I opened with this, but the air quality impacts in, in low moderate income communities, people's rates of asthma are significantly higher, their hypertension and heart disease is higher, their cancer rates are higher. And you know, when we talk about trying to move our society forward toward a more just society, it has to start with getting rid of plastic and reducing our waste overall. And, and we have to eventually shut down all of the incinerators um, and find other ways to, to um, eliminate waste because it's just so vitally important even you know on a local scale right here in Massachusetts as well as on the the global environmental scale so i'm you know i have to say that organizations like conservation law foundation and many of the other environmental organizations that i partner with and we all partner with they do a tremendous job helping us um, understand the science developing the data making the case and your voices individually and collectively have such a tremendous and profound impact working through coalitions like, and organizations like CLF to help us all do our jobs better. So I, I really want to thank Conservation Law Foundation, Kirsty, uh, Tyler, our host, and, and all of you for being here today because your, your very interest in this gives me a lot of hope and, and more energy to go back and do what I do every day. Excellent. I love so it. So thank you. 
Great, great stuff indeed. So, Reptile, uh, Kirsty, th- thank you so very much for taking time out of the day, uh, just kind of really to start your day, if you will, with us on the live stream. Really do, in fact, appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to all those that are watching right now. And you submitted so many questions. I think well over forty questions and comments that you uh, submitted throughout the chat box. Remarkable to see, and it's clearly a hot button issue, and so many people care so much about. So, again, can't say thank you enough to everybody involved. So that'll do it for today's show. But again, the conversation doesn't stop here and we never want it to you make sure to sign up for our e-newsletter um, go to clf.org and also follow us on social media linkedin twitter facebook we're there we would love to have those conversations with you so without further ado i am tyler piper and that'll do it for us today have a wonderful today's thursday have a wonderful thursday and we'll see you next time take care mm-hmm.